Um, good afternoon. My name is Ayita Downey. I'm the coordinator of the PD Green program at Brown, and I'll be introducing Max Kenner. Um, so Max Kenner has lived his life truly in the service of advancing the educational prosperity of the incarcerated. In 1999, he first conceived of the Barred Prison Initiative, which has since transitioned from a prison tutoring program to a vigorous and academically diverse educational program that enrolls about 300 incarcerated men and women each year, each semester. <laughs> Kenner has pioneered the expansion of the Bard Prison Initiative as the executive director of the organization. His awe-inspiring vision has led to the foundation, founding of the Cordisordium for the Liberal Arts in Prison, which has helped to facilitate 10 college and prison programs across the United States. At Bard University, he has become a fierce advocate for education as he served as vice president for institutional initiatives and advisor to the president on public policy. In July 2014, Kenner was appointed and served diligently on the re-entry subcommittee of Governor Andrew Cuomo's New York State Council on Community Re-entry and Reintegration. His dedication to a life in the service of others has been nationally recognized through the Smithsonian American Ingenuity Award in Education, Tribeca Distributive Innovation Award, and the Manhattan Institute's Richard Cornell Award in Education. In accepting his award from the Smithsonian, Kenner stated, that at the Bard Prison Initiative, we provide the same education that anyone in this room would want for their own children. To the people America is most certain can't succeed at anything. They do succeed, it's inexpensive, it's replicable, and we can repeat it. Max Kenner, thank you for believing in the educational prosperity of the disenfranchised, and we welcome you to speak at our conference. Well, thank you, and thanks especially to Susan um, and the center for having us, and to Marissa. Uh, it's really thrilling to be here, and I think it's really symbolic of where we are in the country. Uh, the Brown is as serious as it is in thinking about this work, um, and really a credit to this university that is that it's leading the way, both in the state and hopefully uh, among the Ivy Leagues. Now, I just at the outset want to make one comment on a lot of what we've heard today um, that I think is really important for everyone here at Brown to think about as this moves forward. Um, and that, you know, there are many dozens of things that I would normally say that I'm not going to bother because you've heard them from lots of people very articulately. But Still, when we think about what Brown's impact might be in the prison system here in Rhode Island, one thing that I think we might walk away from today is not focusing on what's so different or what's so exceptional or what's so extraordinary about providing this kind of education in a prison system, but what's familiar and what's the same about it. Right? Because every time we focus on what's different, we end up, a ma hammer needs a nail, right? And we're going to the prison and we're going to make some impact on recidivism or we're going to tailor our curriculum in some special way, which we would never do for our own children, right? Or we'll alter our expectations in some way that focus on our imagined deficiencies among our students rather than their capacity and potential. Right? That happens over and over and over again, not only in this field, but in too many fields where colleges and universities bring what we do best, education, to other kinds of people or other people's children. Right? So again, I think just we want to focus on what's familiar and what's the same, not on what's different. Now, a lot, all the work we do happens at the intersection of two major currents in American life, education and criminal justice. So just forgive me if we sort of weave from one to the other. Um, but one thing that is identical when we talk about this work from a criminal justice perspective and we talk about this work from an education with a capital E perspective, right, is the outcomes we produce according to all the experts are impossible, right? Whether it's in recidivism or income of our alumni or their relationships with their families on the criminal justice side 
or when you look at the educational backgrounds of our students or the geography and where they come from or who their parents are, or all the stuff that the professionals and the social scientists tell us is determinative, our students still go on to accomplish things in education that they're not supposed to, okay? And, you know, when we look, someone asked a question earlier about public policy, and I think we'll skew from that a little bit in, in terms of my remarks. Uh, but another thing that threads a connection between, in our work between education and criminal justice is over the course of the last generation, we have approached our neighbors and are particularly young people with an extraordinary degree of cynicism, right? And that's really obvious when we think about what's now referred to as mass incarceration, right? Longer and longer sentences, smaller and smaller infractions of the law, younger and younger people, more and more punitive approaches to young people, both in criminal justice and in the schools. We think about metal detectors and bubble tests and all that other stuff, which clearly reflect, reflects, in my opinion, a distrust of our own young people, right? So that all is intuitive on the criminal justice side. But I, what I think we have to focus on as leaders in higher education and communities which can influence institutions like Brown is how cynical we've become in our own quarters, right? And that how often even the fiercest advocates of the humanities and of the arts and sciences in places like Ivy League institutions have internalized this crisis of confidence and this belief that we perpetually hear in popular culture uh, and from elected officials and legislatures that the arts and sciences of the humanities somehow are less relevant to this generation of young people than they were for millennia past, right? The leaders in higher education of our best universities have come to believe this too much. So that goes to that first point I made about not focusing on what's different, but focusing on the same. If we believe that literature and the arts and science are relevant to all kinds of people, then the fact that we're teaching in or outside of a prison becomes irrelevant, right? Because the aspiration of the student is what's most important. And when we look at the entire American landscape, if we value the things we say we do in the way we say we do, we know we have to do a radically better job of providing, of engaging, of educating all kinds of people in all pockets of society. And, you know, the people who run these institutions, the people who are supposedly, you know, the smartest guys on the block, right, have showed extreme an extraordinary lack of imagination over the last 30 or 40 years of developing ways to find fabulous, curious, ambitious students, right? Uh, affirmative action has had its place and it's transformed some phenomenal uh, institutions. But rather than simply defending that, we can be assertive and we can develop all kinds of new and different ways that is our honest in that in expressing that we educators bear the burden of finding Americans who will make the best use of the kind of education that we provide right and James said something that really struck me that I'm going to take modest issue with he said it was really beautiful he said everyone in America knows that the route to freedom the path to freedom goes through an education right and there's a real truth to that. I would only say that throughout American history, some people have known it more than others, right? There have always been groups of people in American life who take better or more opportunity from just a sliver of access in real education, right? The group, the constant group, the stereotypical group that's always done that in American life, of course, uh, those are immigrants, right? Every stage of American history, immigrants work harder and recognize the relationship between freedom and education in American life. But they're not the only ones, you know. Uh, we can look at how veterans returning from foreign wars transformed the landscape of higher education throughout the 20th century. And we know 85 years ago, the best colleges in the United States were community colleges in Brooklyn and Queens, 
that were filled with people who weren't allowed to come to institutions like this. And we never, ever talk about it, but no group of people accomplished more with a little bit of access, tiny bit of access, and at every level of education than the generation or two of Americans emancipated from slavery, right? So that connection between education and freedom that James articulated, I think, is exactly right. But I also think if you acknowledge that and you're in a position of working at or leading an institution like Brown and you have the values that you do that think a democratic society can't exist without this stuff really you know, imbuing the body politic, then it's our burden to find those students that will take the most advantage of it. And to me, there's no question of a doubt that in our period in American life, incarcerated Americans are analogous to those other groups. This is a group of people that will make the most of a very small amount of opportunity and run with it um, for a very long time. So we've been at this at Bard for 15 or 16 or 17 years, and we have some experience with it now, and we've gotten some acclaim. But I would say that everything we do at this stage is about as more and more programs begin to open and as there's some changes in public policy, challenging the boundaries of what's considered possible in this field. And there are four fronts uh, that really four pillars to the work we do. The first, of course, is the college itself, which we enroll about 300 students full time in an academic program that spans the breadth of liberal study. Uh, you know, Spanish, German, Mandarin language, foreign language, the natural sciences, mathematics, the breadth of the humanities, etc. cetera. Uh, at our last bachelor's degree graduation, we offer both the AA and the BA degree. Um, just about half the majors at the bachelor's level uh, were concentrations in mathematics, right? That goes quite far, I think, <coughs> in puncturing the liberal prejudice about what people in prison uh, might be interested in or might be capable of, right? There's no, there's no field of study where somehow bizarre ethnic and sort of character sort of assumptions are more pervasive than in math, right? There's always some group of people that we imagine more interested and more capable in that field of study, and it's always wrong, right? Um, but in terms of the curriculum, the thing that's most important is that none of what we do is prescriptive. None of what we do is diagnostic, right? Uh, it may have been James, someone else said this earlier, right? There's no group of people in American life where the average person feels just this comfortable assuming what that person needs even if they've never met that person or don't know anything about them, right? And that's true about people who bring some malice to their assumptions. It's also true of liberals and progressives and academics. Right? You know, Rob's laughing because I'm sure he's seen this a million times. You know, I, you know, there'll be the best uh, biologist in the region will want to teach a class for BPI and we'll come and we'll talk, we'll have lunch and we'll be excited and it'll be great. And then they'll say, you know, I'm going to teach theories of punishment, right? This person has no expertise in theories of punishment, but they figure people in prison don't know much. So, you know, they want to exercise their liberal virtue, you know, <laughs> upon some victim, you know what I mean? And that's, that's very common. Um, and so, you know, just thinking, again, we, we've been at this um, for about 15 years. We've, I spent the first five or six or seven years living in terror, wondering if the last group of incredible students we enrolled was the last one and this was just going to run out and, you know, there'd be no reason to do this anymore. And, and you know, Eddie Ellis, lots of the, who was with me last time I was here at Brown and has since passed away, uh, legendary advocate. Um, of the incarcerated and formerly incarcerated in New York. Um, he, among others, you know, the, all the old timers used to say to me, you know, Max, you have to focus on the long term guys, the guys who've been down a while, who've changed or matured in some way. And if there's anything uh, that's real cause for great optimism in what we do, is how wrong they were. 
our students every year get better and better and they get younger and younger which is extraordinary. You know, again, talk about the crisis of confidence among academics, right? The, the kids these days, you know, are interested in whatever, uh, has just borne uh, to be completely untrue. There's the college itself. Secondly, we do loads of work in reentry, right? We had never had any intention of doing work in reentry until our people started going home, right? The reason we didn't want to do anything reentry is because we were determined to just be a college. Everyone wants to be something else religious, anti-violence, you know, who knows what, bad ideas, right? But what we found was, even in New York, where there are more services for people returning home from prison than probably any place in the history of the world, there were virtually no institutions capable of taking advantage of the ambition and capacity and training of our students, right? The social service establishments, assumptions of people, is that a minimum wage job and staring at, staying out of prison is enough. And if that's, you know, we talked about recidivism being a low bar, that, I mean, that's a little bit higher, May, maybe. We could argue about it, it's higher or not. I don't know. Uh, so we started doing what we've created. We collaborate with institutions, make sure everyone has housing, health care, and access to some employability where there's a prospect of being promoted, right? Not a dead end job. That's really important. Also, it's worth noting that we had students graduate with, uh, finish graduate degrees last year, Columbia, Yale, NYU, all across the CUNY system, right? Again, everything we're doing, just assuming a level of ambition and capacity that starts anywhere but in the fact that students were incarcerated, right? There's the college, there's reentry. Thirdly, we have something uh, that I need to refer to called the Consortium for the Liberal Arts in Prison, right? So. We're trying to push the envelope in the prison in terms of the quality and the rigor and ambition of the academic work in reentry in all kinds of different ways. Uh, and then nationally, about seven years ago, uh, there was increasing interest in the work. And we thought, rather than try to expand what BARD does, which is limited, and frankly is largely successful because it happens at a human scale, right? Why not try to recruit other first-rate educational institutions to get into this line of work? And you know, you have to bribe them, or you lie to them, or you trick them, or you, who knows what you have to do. But you know, we started with Wesleyan University in Connecticut, are now in about 10 states, Washington University in St. Louis, a collaboration between Notre Dame uh, University and Holy Cross College of Notre Dame in Indiana, um, working with Zelda Rowland at Yale, uh, and are very busy not only trying to somehow convince America's best colleges and universities to engage different kinds of people, but also because we always knew in some way public money would come back. And if you let public money return and let the people in the legislatures and Congress, and the Department of Education, and frankly, the leaders in education determine what would happen they would say, it's great that we have college and prison. That's enough. Let's make it the lowest quality, lowest expectation, least ambitious thing we possibly can, right? So it's not that we believe it's only the Wesleyans or the Yales or the Notre Dames who should be in this field, not at all. But when they're there and when students are succeeding at the levels that they do, it's impossible for anyone to claim that we've done enough and we're not capable of doing more, right? Um, so that's the consortium. And lastly, the fourth pillar of what we do is less of an institutional entity and more of an idea, uh, but is really imperative to always remind people of. And that's that for us, the prison site is really incidental. Bard College, Brown University, they're not, they should not be, they should never be in the business of crime prevention, right? or fighting recidivism, right? We're in the business of finding fabulous students who can be fabulous parents and neighbors and change their communities and make American democracy function, right? And that is always worth repeating because the more we focus on the, ed on the prison itself, the more the education we provide will be perverted by that focus. Um, and so we at Bard uh, just this year uh, we've actually started bringing this model of tuition-free college to partnerships with other kinds of institutions other than prisons. Uh, so there's a, there's a center in Holyoke, Massachusetts uh, called the Care Center, which 
provides health care and education and daycare for the poorest mothers in the region. And we've got accreditation uh, to give the Bard Associates degree there and engage their clients in the same way we do people who are incarcerated uh, in New York and provide tuition-free Bard College. And when you think of all the crises in American higher education, opportunity and access on the one hand, cost and excellence on the other, right? Both of these models, right? This kind of college and prison inverts both, which is to say, on the one hand, students are accomplishing things academically that nobody thinks they can, and we're demanding the most of them. But on the other hand, they're leaving with no debt, right? So all the things that we wring our hands about most are s suddenly disappear. It's an extraordinary combination, right? We do things that are meant to be impossible at impossibly low cost, right? Um, and that's uh, worth repeating over and over again. Uh, you know, I, I don't like to talk about it because I have to talk about it so much, but one thing that's symbolic in when we talk about our college is that last year, we've had for a number of years um, a, uh, a debate team at, at, at BPI. It's worth mentioning for two reasons. Um, and last year, we, our team, Harvard visited and we won. It got enormous international attention. It was what it was. Uh, it's worth mentioning now because actually in two weeks the team here from Brown will be coming and we're thrilled about that and that'll be fun. <laughs> and um, they deserve more credit than I'll get into right now, but we're thrilled about that. Um, but also it did something really, all the press around the, the, the competition with Harvard and the fact that Harvard lost was really an education for me because, you know, Boz knows this and Rob knows this, you know, the work is somewhat fashionable now and we can, people smile at us more than they used to, but, but it, a lot of people believe what we do is wrong and always have uh, and maybe always will. Um, and that comes with the territory. But what was so amazing about the Harvard event was it was really just a headline. Right? Google told us it was the ninth most viewed headline in the world last year. And it's interesting, there was no story behind it because we didn't give any information, but the headline went everywhere. And everyone loved it, right? And part of that was obviously, you know, a representation of how much people in America like to see Harvard lose at anything, <laughs> which is funny but true. Um, but it also, you know, everyone who otherwise objected to our works loved the headline. And it made me realize that so often when we talk about being inclusive in American education, people, other people, automatically assume we're lowering standards, that the student isn't actually do, keeping up their end of the bargain, right? And when we talk about providing something at no cost or at a reduced cost for someone who can't afford to pay the full cost, people automatically assume it's some kind of handout, right? And just that headline, right, these students in prison defeat Harvard, smashed both of those illusions and transformed lots of people's assumptions. And that, so it's actually this sort of trivial, goofy thing that became such a phenomenon was really educational, uh, at least for me. Uh, I don't want to take too much time, and we've talked a lot about how I think this work has to be viewed from an educational spec, uh, perspective primarily, but I know many people here are focused on what we now call mass incarceration. And I just want to say a couple things about what we do next for those of you who are really focused on that issue. And there's no question there has been extraordinary transpartisan progress in the understanding and the reform of the criminal justice system, and there'll be more. And there's a huge way left to go, but I think we can be confident that we will end this. And I think we're gonna make extraordinary progress, but as advocates, I think we have to focus on what happens next, right? And I say that because right, if you were a radical abolitionist in the 1850s, 
right? And someone told you that 10 years from now, slavery would be abolished. That was an impossibly good outcome. Abolished across the entire country. It was absolutely impossible. And you would be overjoyed. And yet, if someone told you that despite that reality, 45, 50 years later, labor conditions in the South wouldn't really be all that different, th that would be impossible to wrap your mind around. And if you were a you know, federal bureaucrat in the 1930s building and constructing the New Deal, and someone told you that you were gonna successfully build an apparatus that would create the largest, most prosperous middle class in the history of the world, you would be overjoyed but you would have no idea you were also building an apparatus that perpetuated segregation and apartheid in the United States that would last longer than that prosperity, right? And if you were a freedom rider 50 years ago in Mississippi or Alabama or Louisiana, fighting for basic rights for African Americans in the South and the right to vote, and anyone ever explained to you the level and totality of your success, of your victory, you would be absolutely emotionally overjoyed. But then someone could also tell you that 50 years later, there'd be more African Americans in the United States, African American men in the United States, without the right to vote 50 years from then than in 1965, at the time of the Civil Rights Bill. Right? That's amazing. So at every moment of real progressive accomplishment, throughout American history, you know, there, a reaction has followed, right? And I think if we are going to make sure that whatever comes next, whatever follows mass incarceration, isn't just as bad or isn't worse, we have to put people at the center of the reform. Bureaucratic or administrative adjustments are not gonna get us there. Okay. Um, so just in wrapping up, uh, we spent a lot of time last year with the leadership of the archdiocese who've been really at real allies of ours in New York City. And I was talking with uh, Cardinal Tim Dolan, who's considered a very conservative guy and been a real friend to us. Uh, and he said something really extraordinary and what we thought was very beautiful, which was, he said the church classically believes that God continues his creation through education. Right? Statement of the basic Catholic faith in redemption. Second chances, we might say, in American life. And when we look at everything that's happening at institutions like Brown, right, whether it's Calhoun at Yale or Woodrow Wilson at Princeton or everything that's happened over the years where Brown has really been extraordinary in leading the way in reflecting on its past relationship with American slavery, I think it's worthwhile reflecting on that statement by Cardinal Dolan, and that if we're gonna transform the United States, our institutions can grow and change in the same way that we expect people and individuals in prison to as well. So, thank you. If, the, if, if there were handouts mentioned, um, uh, Rob brought some, they're, they're in the back. Um, there's a, a postcards about our um, exhibit on mass incarceration that's down at the URI Shepherd Building. If there are MA and public humanities students who are walking back to the center, some of our guests could probably use a guide. Uh, so, so stop by and we'll get there. Um, Max will stay, I think, for a minute and yeah. answer questions if you have awesome. any. We have, a, we have in some ways a, um, a, a quick exit, so I maybe, um, um, you, wanna, you wanna take questions from the audience now or you yeah. wanna? Why don't we do oh, that? Yeah, she does, okay. Sure. The boss says yes, so what do you got? <laughs> Maybe yeah, have a question. Or should we go to the hospital about this? <laughs> oh, maybe we're exhausted. <laughs> well, I, um, I know the artist is invested in the arts. Uh -huh. And I wonder, hello? Uh -huh. I wonder how you have, or if you have utilized the arts as part of this. 
prison. Sure. So, you know, I, I certainly hope that I was, I certainly tried to be clear, you know, we try to replicate every part of the curriculum that happens on campus in the prison. And, you know, anytime you enter the prison, it's very easy to focus on things that would be more difficult or would be impossible, right? And, you know, the, pe the things that people fixate on the most instantly are the studio arts and the lab sciences, right? Um, and, you know, we've been able to do both. We haven't had studio arts majors. Uh, we have all kinds of studio art classes. We have music classes. Uh, the president of Bard is a uh, conductor and you know, the, the artistic director of the American Symphony Orchestra, and the symphony comes to the prison every year. Um, so there's all kinds of supplemental things that happen, but also there's no question that whether it be literature uh, and music and the appreciation of art or the practice of art is integral to the curriculum in the same way it, it is on campus. And also, just, just to follow on the first theme, you know, we hear over and over again how impossible it is to study science in the prisons. And while you know you can't have an actual lab, the idea that a student can't leave prison completely ready for graduate school in the elite level in the natural sciences uh, to us is crazy. It's happened and will continue to happen. And um, you just have to be a little creative. Oh, so I, I was I was struck by the contrast between um, what you were talking about about identifying um, great students no matter where there they are and um, <coughs> then what sort of the impression that Nick gave of nine yards about taking a random student and that um, it wasn't as clear there um, the role that education played given all the societal hurdles that exist. And I just wanted to see if you thought that contrast was real, or how do you think about that? Sure, I mean, there, there are a few things I would say. You know, one is that, you know, one thing we've seen over and over again that is one of the great causes for real hope and optimism in the work, and also extraordinary despair in terms of how we're doing in education in American life, is that very often our most ambitious and most successful students go from algebraic illiteracy to calculus one, two, and three and become math majors, love continental literature so they decide to learn German so they can read in the original, right? Go on to do PhDs at wherever. Those kinds of students, right? Those are all real stories. Most often, those are the same people who as young people, as children, dropped out of conventional school the youngest, right? Um, and we at Bard are not in the business of providing remedial education. One thing that we do that's competitive, and I think it sounds like Rob does a similar thing out of Cornell, but that is, that is controversial within the field, is we do competitive admission, right? And it's, the admission process itself is different from everything else that happens in the prison because all the state-funded programs are you know, that the people in the legisl state legislature say have to happen, you know, drug stuff, violence stuff, whatever. You show up, you don't make trouble, and you're done, you're finished, right? What you put into it has no, that's, that's right, right? What you, what you put into it has no relationship with what you get out of it, right? Education is unique in the prisons in that way. And so that's a phenomenon that's true, and it's also true that at least at Bard, we do zero remedial education. You go through this competitive admission process, you get in, we take 15 people at each place where we're at, we're at six places every year, and it's the deep end of the pool. And people thrive. And it's partly because those students know instantly what's at stake. Um, and it's partly because I think in American life, and I think the social sciences bear a lot of blame here, is that we've come to accept all these determinative factors about what we think make people succeed. Um, and we found that most of them, who their parents are, where they're from, right? Half of our best students were diagnosed as stupid in elementary school. And now they're doing advanced math, right? Um, so when we approach students, we simply uh, make no assumptions about them and try to convey that we're deeply invested in their future and their aspirations. Um, 
And so far, they've done very well. I think a quick follow up on what you just said to Matt was, I'm sorry. Are you saying your competitive admissions is also used in the prisons? Oh yeah. Yes, Not yes. everyone is accepted. That's right, that's right. And how do you decide that? Okay, we, that's to, Sorry, we I know that's a big question. We've been talking about that for a long time, yeah. so I'm gonna try, I, I, could, I could go way too long on this, so I'll do it very quickly and we can talk later if you're interested. But essentially it's a two part process. Uh, everybody who wants to apply sits down in a big room or a series of classrooms, cafeteria, gym, whatever. They're given one or two or three very short readings and have two hours to respond to them in any way they want to uh, in writing. Um, and then a group of five of us read each of those and choose a chunk of them. Say there, say there are 100 people apply, maybe between 40 and 60 will make it to the next phase, which is an interview. That interview is a two-on-one, -on short discussion, extremely personal, a lot at stake. It's not in the institute, it's the same for all of us. It's not like if you don't get into Cornell, you get to go to Ithaca College, or you don't get into Bard, you don't get to go to Vassar, you know what I mean? It's, you're the only game in town, and everyone who applies does it publicly. And most people won't get in, so it's a, sort of an act of courage unto itself. Uh, those conversations are fraught, they're difficult, and we pick the 15 that we think collectively will be the most successful. Out of how many applicants would you say? Uh, roughly, it's 100 per place per year, so it, it, it fluctuates wildly. Do, so. do people get in on a second try sometimes? They're typically, at least half of the people we take have applied in the past. And it's purposefully a very subjective process. No bubble tests. There's no waiting in line. Right. Interesting. <laughs> Thanks again. I want to be sure to um, if you join me in thanking our colleagues from Media Services who've done very good work.